Oh, so, uh, so one oh six. And uh, my name is Stone. You can call me uh, Abe or Professor Stone. I'm fine either way. Um, and uh, since there's no reading for today, I probably won't go the whole time, especially because I'm so stressed. Yeah, but we'll see. <laughs> Maybe not. Once I get going, I can't tell. And so I tried to print out hard copies of the syllabus, but uh, I couldn't get the um, printing to work right on this computer. So Visually just got here. This is not my computer, but one I had to borrow because I left my computer at home. I live in Berkeley, so I couldn't go back to <laughs> So, um, so these are not stapled, and I don't think there are enough of them. But I mean, you don't really need a hard copy of the syllabus, uh, but you might want it to follow along while I'm going through it at the beginning. So I don't know. I guess you could pass them out as like maybe if there aren't enough. All right, but I have one copy here. Also, I printed out in this weird way. Well, whatever. It's readable, whatever. Um, okay, yeah, so this is weird. Um, I'm seeing a mirrored. That must be something I turned off when I first used Zoom a long time ago. Oh well, it doesn't matter. All right. Um, so what I'm going to do today is just uh, like go through the syllabus and um, you know talk about the class requirements, whatever, and then I'm going to give it. Uh, general introduction to the course uh, to explain why we have this course and so forth. <laughs> um, so, uh, right, so my name I already wrote up there. Um, the <clears throat> best way to reach me is by email. Um, I try to check my email at least a couple times a day. So, uh, um, if uh, I put my office phone number here, but since, as I just said, I, li I live in Berkeley, I'm not in my office that much. <laughs> um, so that's not really a good way to, to reach me. Um, I have this thing set up, notify Abe, which in an emergency, but I actually, I haven't put in the list of people from this class yet. I have to remember to do it. But in an emergency, you can send a push notification to my phone using this, this uh, Google Apps. Um, and you can send a short message, like, please check your email or whatever. Um, there's no way for me to respond to that, though. I set that up a long time ago when I used to be worse at getting to my email. I think it shouldn't be necessary now, but it's still there. I think it still works. Um, all right. So the... Um, my website, people, And there's like a list of all the courses I've ever taught, but the ones I'm teaching now are at the top. <laughs> so, um, and from there, there's a link to the syllabus and there's links to the assignments. The assignments are already up there. Um, there's also a link to the syllabus from the Canvas page. Um, if you try to get to it that way. Um, um, if uh, you don't remember this, you can Google Abe Stone philosophies with ECSC or whatever you can find it. Um, okay. Um, 
And, you know, if there are any changes to the syllabus or whatever, I'll make changes to the online syllabus. Um, there usually aren't any changes, but sometimes there's like a strike or something. So, um, um, okay, I guess I'll just keep going through the syllabus in order. Um, course description. So this course, so the title of the course is Kant, but it's not everything Kant ever wrote, which is a lot of stuff. It's one specific book, The Critique of Pure Reason, which is his most important book, although he wrote a lot of important books. Um, uh, and uh, we're not going to be reading all of it because it's too long to read in one quarter, but we're going to be reading a lot of it. Um, so uh, um, that's what the course is about. Um, I'm going to be uh, lecturing in person here, um, and I uh, definitely uh, hope people will come to lectures in person. However, I'm also uh, streaming it via Zoom, and I'm also recording the lectures, and I put them up on YouTube. Um, usually, they'll be uh, put them up at night when I get home, or maybe the next morning. Um, and uh, there's one other wrinkle that has to do with that, which is that um, this year the Jewish holiday schedule is terrible. There's basically the first four Tuesdays of the quarter are, are like hit by Jewish holidays. Um, so what I'm doing about that is, as you can see, if you turn to the reading schedule, um, so there's going to be three Wednesdays when I'm going to give a Zoom lecture on Wednesday at the regular time, but on Wednesday rather than Tuesday. Um, and that'll be Zoom only. Um, and, you know, if you can come at that time, great. If you can't, uh, it will be recorded. Um, um, and there's gonna be one Tuesday where I will be lecturing, but I won't be here. So also will be at the regular time, but only via Zoom. Those are all listed on the syllabus. Um, I'm sorry about that, but um, that's the way it worked out this year. Um, are there any questions about that so far? So that's starting the very next class. It's gonna be moved to Wednesday and it's gonna be on Sunday. Um, and uh, Thursdays will all be normal. Okay. Um, so course requirements, um, there's two take home midterms and um, one take home final, although you also have an option of writing a paper rather than doing the take home final. Um, so for the paper, I don't have like a workout assignment, although if you you know want to talk to me about topics, um, we can talk about it. Um, it says here, students who receive an A minus or higher on the first two exams may choose to write a final paper. I mean, the reason I, the reason I said that was because um, the idea is that the final paper is harder than the final exam. Right, like the final exam, you just have to answer, uh, uh, I think two or maybe three, I forget, uh, essay questions, right? And so like the question is all set out for you. Um, you don't have to think of an idea, whatever, you just have to answer it. Um, I mean, some of the questions maybe are kind of hard because content is kind of hard, but still it's easier than thinking of your own <laughs> um, idea for a paper. On the other hand, so why might you want to write a paper instead given that it's harder, well, you know, um, uh, it's good practice writing papers. Uh, it's good, like if you're thinking of going to grad school in philosophy, it's good to write papers, especially if I might need to write a, write a letter for you someday, it's good to have given me papers, right? So that's why I have this option here, um, but I'm not like su not suggesting that everyone do it just because this material is pretty hard and writing a paper about Kant after just 10 weeks, you know, like coming up with your own thesis and whatever is, is difficult. <laughs> so, um, 
Um, okay, so anyway, so those those three assignments are already up online. You can you know already see what the questions are going to be. If you can already do them now, if you want. Although I, I don't, I haven't set up the Canvas assignments to turn them in yet. But <laughs> um, so that um, so you'll you'll turn them in using Canvas. Um, it says here the final paper is approximately eight to ten pages. That maybe is a little bit too long. Not very many people usually do that. So, but if you want to do that, talk to me about it. Um, okay. Um, Exams are due by 11.55 p.m. on the due date. That's really, I should probably change that now that we're using Canvas. I used to just say that exams are, you know, they're due on such and such a day. And then people were like, well, when are they due? And I was like, midnight, I guess. <laughs> and then they were like, but actually, technically, some people were complaining because actually technically midnight is like, the, the beginning of the, you know, whatever. So I said, okay, 11.55. But the truth is I'm not sitting there with a stopwatch, like trying to figure out exactly when the paper came in. I, you know, just try to, you know, whatever. Um, so anyway, but that's, that's, if you want to know, that's the answer. They're due by 11.55 PM. And, um, and then there's this uh, FAQ I have, there's a uh, link to it on the online syllabus. Um, I haven't changed that for many years, but I think it still pretty much applies. <laughs> um, and the final line here about the course requirements is attendance at lecture is strongly encouraged, but it's not a course requirement and I'm not taking attendance. So that probably means a lot of people will stop coming, but uh, I strongly encourage you to not stop coming. <laughs> okay. Um, and the text, uh, which just fell on the floor, So this is the translation that I ordered. This is, I don't, uh, my bookmark is a parking ticket. Um, <laughs> anyway, uh, <laughs> this is the translation I ordered, Kemp Smith. Um, it's not necessarily the best translation. Uh, it's, I mean, I think it's, I think it's good. There, there may be a translation I even think is better, but basically translations in general are not very good um, of philosophy. Uh, there's only so good they can be, and usually they're not that good either. Um, so, uh, um, but you know, this is the one I've been using to teach this course for years. So, like all my uh, notes are keyed to it and whatever. So, um, so that's the one I ordered. You know, if you want to use a different translation, go ahead. It might be a little, I mean, all the assignments, um, I'll talk about this more in a second, but. All the assignments use the um, Kant's original page numbers, which are printed in the margins here. So if you wanted to use a different translation, you could find the pages in that one also. Um, uh, of course, if you read German, you should read it in the original. But <laughs> um, anyway, um, so, oh, yeah, so you can. I mean, you probably already figured this out by now, but uh, you, right that you can you can buy this through the um, Bay Tree Bookstore, which is now called the Bay Tree. Uh, it's not called something else. Anyway, you can buy it through the, what used to be called the, the artist formerly known as Bay Tree Bookstore. Um, but there's also uh, the if you don't want to own it, the library has an ebook on reserve, and there's a link to that. Um, on the online syllabus now. So, <clears throat> um, and you know, that's free. So if you, if you don't mind using an ebook and you don't want to own it, that's another option. Um, okay. Yeah, oh, I guess, so I should explain the A and B page numbers. Right, so there were two uh, main, well, I mean, there was more than two editions, but there was, uh, the first edition of the Critique of Pure Reason was published in 1781. Um, and 
then um, in 1787, uh, published a um, um, substantially revised edition. Right, so these are usually called the A edition of the edition. There are other versions editions after that, but they were all pretty much the same as the B edition, just like small changes. But there were big change changes between the A edition and the B edition. So, um, um, and like modern translations usually translate the text of both the A and the B edition. Why is that? I mean, my, I mean, so like, first of all, you might think if this is kind of revised text, we should just read this, right? I mean, we thought this was better than that. <laughs> and actually that is we're gonna do what we're gonna do in this course. We're just gonna be reading the B edition text. Um, but uh, Kant himself in the B, the preface to the B edition, or the B preface, as we say, um, Kant himself in the B preface says, um, you know, uh, in order to do this revision, I had to cut some stuff out in some places in order to add more stuff in other places. I guess he didn't want the book to get um, a lot longer. It was already very long. Um, and he says, but it's okay because you could always check back in the original edition. Of the <laughs> so that's one reason why people like print both texts because Kant himself said that there's certain things in that A edition that he cut out in the B edition, but that you might still be interested in. Although he didn't say what things those were, which, well, I mean, because it's actually not clear what, which part he's thinking about when he says that. Um, um, but uh, moreover, uh, since more or less the beginning, there has been readers who caught thought that the A edition was better and that Kant made a mistake when he revised it into the B edition. Um, Schopenhauer was one of them. So uh, um, that's another reason why people print both the A and B edition, because even though Kant thought the B edition was better, um, not everyone agreed with Kant. And if, like, if you're seriously trying to figure out what's going on here, you might you know, want to compare the two and see if the A edition makes more sense. Um, and I had actually taught this course before using only the A edition text, um, but I'm not doing that this year. I haven't done that for a long time. Um, uh, I think overall, I think it makes sense either to, to, to read both together, but I think that's kind of confusing for the first time you're reading the book. Um, or just to read the B edition, um, especially because I'm one of the people, and like Hegel was one of these people who thought that the B edition is definitely much better than the A edition. <laughs> Kant was right to switch from one to the other. Um, by the way, I mean, Kant maintained that he didn't change his mind about anything between the A or very little. He says there's very little that's new. He mentions one thing that's new, the refutation of idealism. But he says that it's big, he, he says it's just a matter of presentation. Right, that he's just like because he realized that the edition was misunderstood, he's redone things in order to be clear. But again, a lot of people feel, and for myself, I'm not really sure about this. But a lot of people feel that no, he really did change his mind about something. Philosophers aren't necessarily trustworthy when they talk about what they used to believe, right? Because they like. Um, they become interpreters of their own previous work. <laughs> and they start to interpret it according to what they think now. <laughs> uh, right, so that's why even though Kant says he didn't change his mind about anything, uh, it's you know open to people to say, no, he really did. <laughs> uh, all right, so anyway, I mean, that's uh, like, that's about the difference between the two editions and why we're reading the edition. The only other thing to add is like to explain how to read the B edition, since this text has both. Um, but fortunately, it's easier to read the B edition than the A edition because so what Kemp Smith did is to basically print the B edition and then like indicate where the A edition is different. So like when you you look at the page, you'll see like little things in the margin, you know, A236 or B, you know, 315 or 
whatever. Um, so that means that this, and it's only approximate, right? Because you have to change the order of the words when you translate from German into English. So you can't say exactly which word the page break is. <laughs> but, but that means this is approximately where page 315 starts in the bridge. Um, and this is approximately where page 236, 236 starts in the A edition. Right, so that, the, the, you know, because he changed the text so much, the pagination changed. So in some places they're in sync, but in a lot of places they're not. Um, but like, as long as you see these B numbers in the margin, you know you're reading the B text. <laughs> and you can just ignore the A numbers. Um, sometimes there'll be a footnote saying like, you know, Ken Smith's footnote saying in A, Todd says what, whatever, right? But there's a few places, including um, the, uh, probably most important section of the book, the Transcendental Deduction, where Kant completely redid it for the B edition. And in that case, what Kemp Smith does is to print the whole A edition version first, and then the whole B edition. So, uh, like, if you're not paying attention, you if you suddenly get to a part where all the numbers at the margin are all A's, <laughs> that means you're reading a part that is only the A edition text, and you should be skipping it and look looking for the B edition. Um, I think this I'm making it more sound more confusing than it is, but are there questions about this? Okay. Well, if if you do get confused when you're reading it, you can always like email me and ask me. <laughs> um, or ask me in class or whatever. Um but like I said, in most places, it's pretty straightforward. In most places, the text that, that Ken Smith has printed is just the B edition text. And if there's any differences, hope there's any differences. All right. Um, any other kind of... Um, Well, I guess I should mention office hours. So I have not set office hours yet, um, but I think, um, so to begin with, office hours are gonna be by Zoom only, um, but I'm hoping, I think after the this holiday craziness, Jewish holiday craziness dies down, the next month maybe I'll have some in-person office hours if people are interested in that. I mean. Anyway, I'll, but uh, not yet because there's because my Thursdays are totally full and the Tuesdays I'm not going to be here. So, um, but after there's after Tuesdays, um, I'm back into existence. I have some in person office hours as well. Um, okay, are there any questions about any of that, like administrative stuff or whatever? No. Okay. So I'll just start talking about Kant a little bit. Um, um, so, but maybe actually before I talk about Kant, um, um, I'm going to talk a little bit about my teaching style. Um, so, uh, so like my lectures are about the reading. <laughs> um, so, I mean, they're not like substitutes for the reading. I mean, I, like I can't say better than Kant did what Kant was trying to say. Um, a lot of people, I guess, do think that when it comes to Kant, that you often hear that Kant was a terrible writer or something like that. Um, I tend to think that that uh, whatever problems there are caused by uh, with Kant's so to speak writing style are you know um, are expressions of his philosophical position <laughs> that he couldn't just have said the same thing quote 
better written, right? Like, I mean, if you think about the difference between Hume and Kant, for example, so like Hume is a good writer. Um, uh, it's, well, I, I don't know if you guys have if you've read Hume, I found it pleasant to read Hume or not. But but reading Hume is kind of pleasant, you know. Um, reading Kant is kind of unpleasant. <laughs> um, the thing is, though, like I mean, from Hume's point of view, making an argument basically consists in making it pleasant for the person who's listening to you to believe what you're trying to get them to believe. <laughs> That's what an argument is, according to Hume. So of course he writes that way. Whereas according to Kant, that's the worst thing you could do. <laughs> right? So that's why I'm saying it's not like Kant could have just written the same thing only in Hume style. Um, or at least that's a first indication of maybe why not. So in any case, um, yeah, so I don't feel like I can, you know, like I can substitute for doing the reading. So like my lectures, I mean. I know that not everyone is going to be doing all the readings, so uh, I, you know, I'll do my best to make sense to someone who hasn't done it. But like, uh, basically, like a lot of what I'm saying, I have to, I have to assume that you, you've read it and had trouble understanding it or worried about it, and I'm talking about like problems about it, puzzles about it. Why is it organized this way? You know. Is Khan using this term consistently? Stuff like that. Um, um, I mean, at least that's that's a big part of what I talk about when I'm lecturing. So, um, um, and when I say you know problems, like I don't necessarily mean objections. I mean, like if I have an objection to Khan, that that. From another point of view, that can look like an objection to my interpretation of Kant, <laughs> right? You know, like these two, you know, objection, these two things he says are not consistent. So, but from another point of view, it's like you must be understanding them wrong because um, on your interpretation, the two things he said are not consistent, <laughs> right? So, um, so like a lot of times it's not clear how to look at it, but anyway, there are problems and yeah, sometimes it, but it's kind of a solution of last resort. The solution to the problem could be, oh yeah, Kant, you know, just doesn't make sense. <laughs> but it's, I mean, it's, it's gonna be a solution of last resort because if you say that too often, then like you might as well not read this book, right? I mean, you know, well, why would it be interesting if it's, got, if it's just all full of mistakes? <laughs> Um, right, so, um, um, is there anything else I want to say about that? Yeah, and I guess, um, you know, I think students will sometimes find the way I lecture about a text like this frustrating because you feel like I didn't really understand the basic point of what he was saying. And now you're getting into these like worries about how, what's the structure and, you know, stuff like that. Um, you know, uh, just explain to me what the basic point of what he was saying is first. But, um, I guess, I think understanding what Kant is basically saying means like, first of all, um, noticing problems like that in the text. <laughs> like that's, you know, that's, that's the first step to, to actually like, I mean, yeah, you can't understand a text like this the way you understand a newspaper article, right? Like skim it to get the main point. <laughs> you just can't do that. You have to like find the places because when when you read it, I certainly remember when I first read this book, I didn't feel like I understood it very well at all. <laughs> you know? And but and the the way into it is to start like asking questions about it. Like if you can find the right question, then you're on the 
path to, to actually understanding something. Uh, I don't know if that makes sense or not, but anyway, that's what I think. Uh, other questions about any of this? Now I am gonna talk about Kant. All right. Um, so, so like, why do we have a course that's all about Kant, it's all about just this book? Um, well, uh, basically, like, Kant is extremely important in the history of modern Western philosophy. Um, and so, um, So roughly speaking, very roughly speaking, up until a certain point, for many centuries, philosophy was Aristotelian. And, you know, that meant a lot of things. It didn't mean everyone agreed with each other, right? Because although they pretty much all agreed that Aristotle was an authority, which means that Aristotle is right about most things. So if you want to settle an argument, you can quote Aristotle, okay? So, you know, uh, um, they, they agreed about that, but they didn't agree what Aristotle meant. So <laughs> they, could, they could disagree about everything else <laughs> and both sides be citing Aristotle in your favor, <laughs> right? So that's what Aristotelianism was like. Um, you know, they didn't necessarily agree about everything, but I mean, one thing that they did agree about, although they meant different things by it, is that in order for us to have knowledge, of the world, we need two things. We need sense and intellect or reason. Intellect and reason um, are not necessarily synonyms. In fact, Kant, in effect, is going to distinguish between them. But for the moment, I just say sense on the one hand, right, like our senses, and intellect or reason on the other. And what happened at the beginning of the modern period and again, this is a gross oversimplification, but um, uh, this is the right time for a gross oversimplification, um, that uh, the early modern philosophers, um, the one thing they agreed with each other about was that they weren't Aristotelians. <laughs> so and in particular, they agreed that this view that knowledge has these two sources, sense on the one hand and intellect or reason on the other hand, um, and that you couldn't have knowledge of the world without both um, was wrong. Only uh, what they didn't agree about is which one is the only one you need. <laughs> so they split up into these two schools. Empiricism, and rationalism, right? So this is in terms of uh, our course sequence. This is philosophy 100C and this is philosophy 100B. Um, right, the empiricists um, were people who thought that um, the only basis for knowledge about the world was our senses. Now, of course, they had to uh, agree that there, there's some use for intellect or reason, right? But they said the only use for it was like to, you know, arrange and uh, um, um, deduce consequences from the things that we already learned through our senses. Wasn't an independent source of knowledge. Whereas on the other hand, the rationalists said that the only way we know about the world is by reason. Of course, they had to, again, they had to explain that the senses are good for something. Um, so in, in this case, the story is more complicated, but it basically like um, um, what Descartes says, and I guess uh, Spinoza and Leibniz really agree with this is, that the senses are not useful for finding out what the world is like. What they're useful for is like um, avoiding bad things and going towards good ones. 
right? So they're like practically useful, but they're not useful for knowledge. Um, so, uh, right, so now this way that I just divided early modern philosophers, uh, philosophy into these two schools. Um, first of all, it's not like, um, they didn't call themselves empiricists and nationalists. Um, and it's not the only way you could divide them up into people in this period, right? We're talking basically like 17th to 18th century. It's not the only way you can divide them up. It um, doesn't catch all the important philosophers very well. I mean, it catches the big six, right? Like um, uh, Locke, Barclay, Hume, Descartes, um, Spinoza, and Leibniz. But like, it's not clear where to put Hobbes or Newton, or, right? So like, um, um, uh, how, so, like, I don't think it's a bad way of organizing this period, but there's still a question, where does it come from? Why is it so influential? Why is it built into the structure of our courses in this department? Um, and the reason is because this is how Kant organized the views of his predecessors about epistemology. About what we now call epistemology. The word epistemology was invented in the 19th century. Um, what we now call epistemology, right? The theory of like what we can know and how we can know it. Right? So when so when he like looked at what his immediate press of predecessors had done, he you know um, said uh, well, they, you know, they basically each took one of the Aristotelian sources of knowledge and tried to work with only that. And, um, and, um, and, he, and then he said, uh, moreover, they were both wrong. <laughs> and they both, in some sense, made the same mistake. So I'm not going to try to explain what the same mistake was, but it's basically it's what Kant called transcendental realism. So we'll see him talking about it. Um, but um, but they they were both they were led into these wrong positions by both thinking about knowledge and its object in the wrong way. Um, and. Um, Therefore, they both ended up with absurd conclusions. So, like, if you take a 100B or 100C, um, then and I guess you're supposed to have taken one of the other. Do you have a question? Oh, no, All right. So, like, um, then you know that, like, on the one hand, that, um, that 100C ends with Hume proving that. Uh, the idea of an external object, like a body, is um, um, self-contradictory, and yet we're forced to believe that. <laughs> right. So um, that you know, he 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 makes this argument that he says is like um, you know um, incontrovertible, but where the conclusion is that like there's no not only is there no reason to believe that external objects exist, right? That things exist outside my mind. But in fact, uh, it's not like that belief isn't coherent. Um, but then he says, but of course, you know, as soon as you close this book, like half an hour hence, you will once again believe in body. You can do with that. <laughs> right? So that's the conclusion of the empiricists. Um, Whereas on the other hand, the conclusion of uh, the rationalists is Leibniz is that the world consists of an infinite number of angels. <laughs> right? I mean, it's, um, and again, that the, the, the idea of an extended substance or a body is actually self-contradictory according to Leibniz too. 
So Leibniz says that when we think that there are such things as bodies, we're mistaking the confused way our senses represent these um, immaterial, indivisible entities, the monads, right? The things I was calling angels. Um, it's, you know, and that if you try to actually clarify that and explain how something like that could actually exist, um, you would get into self-contradictions involving the, the concept of a continuum, right? Like of a, um, a, a finite quantity made out of an infinite number of identical points. So, um, so both of these slides essentially conclude that bodies um, don't exist and are in fact impossible, <laughs> which is worrying. <laughs> so, um, so what Kant tried to do is um, to um, show that no bodies do exist. <laughs> Um, and we can know about them, and this is how we can know about them. And he said, to know about them, we, we need both of those sources, right? We need both sense and reason. So in, so in some ways, he's going back to a like, pre-modern position. Um, but uh, um, he doesn't just go back to it. He, um, it's kind of like, uh, so, you know, Aristotle is oftentimes viewed as a defender of common sense. And he is a defender of common sense, right? He'll take things that, Aristotle will take things that we ordinarily say about animals or bodies or whatever, and um, explain why they're right. But the explanation of why they're right itself is not common sense, right? It's like tactical and weird. It just comes out with the right answer. So, so Kant is, so to speak, another iteration of that, <laughs> right? I mean, he's ultimately trying to explain why it's right to say that we live in a world of bodies and that there are causes and effects and, and so on and so forth, um, and that we know about it through our senses, but that senses aren't enough, that you also need a, um, a faculty of intellect to, to know about it. He's, he's trying to explain why all of that makes sense, but uh, he is trying to explain it by giving a um, completely new and strange and radical understanding of like what the relationship between a knowing being and the world that it knows is and things like that. Right? So, so that's what Kant tried to achieve, at least in the realm of epistemology and metaphysics, right? Kant is also famous as a moral philosopher, and those two things are closely related. We'll see Kant, you know, doing things in this book that are in preparation for his moral philosophy. In the end, I think that's what he thought was really important. Um, but anyway, as far as epistemology and metaphysics, that was Kant's achievement. And so he, right, so it is so the way he like synthesized everything that had come down before, right? Put it together in a new way, try to make sense of it. And then afterwards, um, uh, in the 19th century and after, like almost everything, almost, although not everything, <laughs> but almost everything interesting that happened in philosophy was one way or another came out of um, so, uh, um, um, so like on the one hand, we had the, the so-called post-Kantian idealists, right? The most important one being Hegel. Um, so uh, British and American philosophy in the later 19th century and the very beginning of the 20th century was basically all Hegelian. Neo-Hegelian. Um, 
This is stuff we don't remember that much anymore, but it's important because um, Bertrand Russell, who is one of the ancestors of the kind of philosophy that's now done in English speaking countries, was um, educated as a neo Hegelian and started off writing as a neo Hegelian. And then he turned against it, right? But when a philosopher turns against something, that means usually that, like, um, that thing they're turning against has a huge influence on what they're going to say. Right? Because it's like they have to, that's the thing that they have to attack. So they have to, like, adjust themselves precisely to that. And I think there's a lot of signs of that in Russell. Um, so, you know, on the other hand, there was Schopenhauer, who um, hated Hegel and the other post-Kantian idealists, um, thought that this was all a bunch of nonsense. Like I said, he, he, they thought the B edition was better. He thought the A edition was better. <laughs> Um, uh, you know, so what kind of influence does Schopenhauer have? Well, Nietzsche, our jobs before was with Schopenhauer, right? So Nietzsche and everyone is influenced by Nietzsche is like also part of this post-Kantian development. Um, furthermore, there's another kind of more complicated thing that happened, which is that so um, before the dominance of Hegelianism, and to a certain extent even still alongside it, um, British empiricism continued in the 19th century. But that, like the most the most famous person here would be John Stuart Mill. But he wasn't the only one, and there wasn't even just one school of it. There was a Scottish school, an English school, that were disagreed with each other about a lot of things. Um, this whole, so these people, I mean, they knew about Kant. Mill talks about Kant. I don't think he's a very careful reader of Kant, but he's like aware of it, you know. Um, uh, I, someone was laughing. When I say he's not a careful reader of Kant, I don't mean to say because he's an idiot. <laughs> it's not, John Stuart Mill is not an idiot. <laughs> Very interesting, but like Kant is a little bit outside his radar. I mean, he's you know he's sufficiently open that he wants to engage with it, but it's really pretty foreign to his way of thinking. Um, but in any case, um, um, so like this later part of British empiricism doesn't have that much direct descendants in later. British and American philosophy, because like I said, Hegelianism comes into the picture. Like if you look at the big philosophy journals that are still around today, that started in the late 19th century, if you look at the early issues, you'll see that like all the papers are German idealists. They're like all Hegelians, right? So, um, but, um, Franz Prince Harman, in Austria in the late 19th century um, was mostly actually a descendant of this school. Right, his, his famous book was called Psychology from an Empirical Standpoint. <laughs> um, uh, so it's most, mostly, and he mentions all these people a lot, all these late empiricists, both the Scottish and the British um, and his pupil was Husserl. Now, um, Husserl is in many ways, therefore, also a descendant of this school, but at the same time, Husserl, unlike Brentano, Brentano thought that, uh, um, that Hegel was nonsense and that Kant was a kind of bad skeptic. Right, so Bertano himself was pretty dismissive of all this stuff. But Husserl, um, and increasingly as his career went on, I think, started to read Kant and like try to understand himself as a Kant. 
He was the founder of the School of Club Phenomenology. And among his students were Heidegger, Martin Heidegger, who's kind of the founder of like what we now know as continental philosophy. So, um, um, the later French and German philosophy post war was mostly influenced by Heidegger. And on the other hand, another one of his students was Rudolf Carnap who was one of the founders of logical empiricism. And that was the school that became dominant in the post-war period in English speaking countries. Right, now known as analytic philosophy. So, um, you know, Heidegger wrote, a, wrote actually more than one book about Kant. <laughs> right, but it's take, taking this clue from Lusserl, like how to, how to be a phenomenologist in the continent and taking it farther, trying to take it deeper. Carnap is not that interested in the history of philosophy per se, but there are a lot of um, um, deliberately, like, deliberate uses of Kantian terminology in Carnap. He didn't write a book, he wouldn't write a book about it, right? He thinks of himself as a kind of um, and I guess maybe one other thing I should write in here would be Marx. He's a follower of a weird kind of follower of Hegel. Um, uh, also, well, obviously very influential in the real world, as, as he said, right? He didn't want to just understand the world, he wanted to change it. Um, but also pretty influential in the history of philosophy, especially in like what happened in France and Germany um, in the later 20th century was that people tried to put together these like Heideggerian philosophies. Heidegger was a Nazi, right? He's an icon, he's now the end of the spectrum, but tried to put together this Heideggerian philosophy in one way or another with Marx. Um, so, um, so like if you take all this stuff, and I could draw more lines in here too, right? But like, for example, both Heidegger and Carnap were very interested in Nietzsche. Um, but in any case, if you take all this stuff together, you have like basically like the whole philosophical, almost the whole philosophical landscape as it exists today. So the point I'm making is not only does everything kind of flow into Kant, but then everything kind of flows back out. Um, and this book, The Critique of Pure Reason, is the like central piece of this philosophy that everything else rests on. Um, so, um, so that's why we have this book. <laughs> that's why it's worth spending a whole quarter or, or more than that, really. But anyway, that's what we have, right? It's worth spending a whole quarter trying to understand it yourself. Um, uh, I mean, I guess this is kind of an external explanation, making it seem almost like if things had turned out differently, this course would be about John Stuart Mill instead or something. There's, I'm sure, I think there's something to that. Right, like, um, uh, there are kind of, um, ways that certain people or certain books get, uh, made central to philosophy, but it could have been someone else. Maybe in all fairness, it should have been someone else. I mean, Obviously, that's especially the kind of thing we think about now. We notice that was, like none of the names I wrote down here are names of women; they're all men, right? Um, so, uh, um, so like I said, I think you know. It, so maybe in some other world, this course would be about Mary Wollstonecraft or something, and how philosophy would flow into and out of her. But her life would have been really different in that world. Her works would have been different, right? So, um, but in any case, um, so I think there's something to that, but nevertheless, uh, um, 
I don't think it's that's all there is to it. They, but I mean, um, although John Stuart Mill is a, is a very interesting philosopher, Kant is, I think, is a better philosopher, more interesting philosopher, right? There's a reason why Kant was so influential. Um, um, so that's another reason to have this book, right? But if all these people thought it was worth reading, <laughs> really worth putting it. It probably is worth reading. <laughs> so, um, okay. Um, are there any questions about any of that? All right. So in that case, I think I will end here. Um, and I'll see you over Zoom on Wednesday. Okay. Thank you.